quality of death and dying. I mean, at end of life care is a very subjective concept and a very subjective issue. So I'm going to kind of go into a little bit of the research about how we actually go ahead and make this objective so that we can study this in an efficient way. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about advanced planning and some of the um, newer uh, trends and theories out there in the literature and some of my own as well. I'm going to start off with this photograph. So this is kind of when people, when I tell people that I'm interested in death and dying, they say, oh, you're Dr. Death. And this is the image that they come up with in their head. Um, and I like to kind of put this out there just because I like to sort of um, get people away from thinking of end of life issues and death and dying in this sort of death and dying and end of life experiences are so important to talk about is that it's something that we all experience. It's universal, whether we live in Philadelphia or Africa or Europe or wherever we're from or wherever we're going, end of life care and end of life issues is something that's relevant. It's fundamental. So just like we all are born, we are all going to die. It's something we're all going to experience. And it's relevant, meaning whether you're going to be a cardiologist, an internist, a pediatrician, a social worker, a nurse, uh, end of life issues are something that your patients are going to face. And there's a tremendous amount of research about this very phenomenon. And this is where I kind of want to start, is just with some basics and fundamentals. We're going to take a look at age, race, gender, and disease, and how these factors go into end of life decision making and preferences. So as much as I'm against racism or classifying people based on the color of their skin or their race or their culture, we'd be making a huge mistake as healthcare providers to ignore the fact that there are tremendous racial differences and cultural differences in end-of-life preferences. Um, I'm talking overall principles here, so some of the research I'm going to present to you obviously uh, shouldn't be um, streamlined into an individual, but these are more talking about keeping it in context as a group in general. Okay? So to start off with African-American patients, in general, they opt for more aggressive care. This has been seen over and over in research studies and reviews. They tend to uh, prefer CPR, life-sustaining measures. They're more likely to utilize and use feeding tubes and prefer feeding tubes. And they're less likely to possess a DNR order in a chart when you look at survey studies. And what's interesting is that the African-Americans, although they, they utilize uh, end-of-life resources more, their attitudes about advanced directive and knowledge is different than Caucasian counterparts as well. So they're, um, if you're Caucasian, you're more likely to possess an advanced directive, for better or for worse. Caucasians, on, in general, on survey studies, are more knowledgeable about advanced directives and have more positive attitudes about advanced directives. And so that's really important for us to consider when we're taking care of patients and that you know, we need to educate people of all races and all cultures about the benefits of these documents. Entities, different things became more important in one disease versus another. So for example, with COPD, patient education is very, very important to this patient population, which is relevant to me as a pulmonologist in my outpatient clinic when I'm talking to my COPD patients. I try to keep that in the back of my mind that I really need to focus with this population on patient education. Patients with cancer were very, very concerned with maintaining hope. That was important to them. Whether, regardless of whether they had a stage four terminal disease or not, hope was a very important part of their care, what they wanted from their physician. Patients suffering from AIDS, they, felt they wanted more um, information and focus on pain control. And so these kinds of studies can help us when we're counseling our patients as physicians or social workers or hospice providers or just as uh, family members are obvious to say why advanced directives are important. I mean, we like patient autonomy, empowerment, we love this stuff, right? We want our patients making their own decisions. We want to decrease the family, or excuse me, decrease the burden on our family members. So, you know, if we get sick, we don't want our families to be sort of stressed with these terrible decisions, you know, life or death decisions that just are sort of thrown on them without any prior warning. And go into the big problem with advanced directives. Uh, they're not all roses, and I think it's very dangerous that patients um, and family members think, oh, I have an advanced directive, I made it in my attorney's office, I'm ready, it's okay, no matter what, you know, I have it all in place, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be okay. It's a common misperception and one that um, is a very important part of my advocacy and what I write about to um, try to sort of flip that misnomer and educate people about it. Really quick cases, just to illustrate this, and I'm sorry, originally I made this slide for, for uh, a different audience, so I'm sure, you know, you know what the pneumonia is and you know what the heart is. But there's some non-medical people here, so here's the heart and here's the pneumonia. So. Uh, this is Mr. B. This is a patient I took care of at a local hospital, a 90-year-old gentleman, uh, lived at home with his son, who is his named power of attorney. He has a documented hand. Came to the ER with shortness of breath, fever, 
had some blood pressure, some diabetes, some high cholesterol, coronary artery disease. Um, he was really sick in the ER. He had a very high fever. His pulse was 125. He was breathing really fast. He was delirious from his fever. He had checked up on his advance directive, on his living will. I do not want mechanical ventilation. And this was his x-ray. So you have this pneumonia here. So what would you do in this situation? Would you intubate this gentleman? Who would intubate this man? Who would not intubate this man? I'm sure you would not intubate based on the advanced directive. But here's the thing, is that Mr. B doesn't have a terminal condition. He has a reversible condition. He has a pneumonia. His advanced directive doesn't apply here. So the majority of us as ICU doctors would actually intubate unless the patient himself said in a competent, cognitive way, I don't want to be intubated. But based solely on his advanced directive, the fact that that terminal condition, he doesn't have a terminal condition. There's nothing here that's terminal. Um, you know, granted, he probably will die, and he did die of this pneumonia, but a pneumonia is a reversible thing, and that's where the word irreversible and reversible becomes so challenging. So now let's look at Mrs. B. Same exact story. She's 90, she lives at home with her daughter, her mm -hmm. daughter is a power of attorney, but she has stage four metastatic breast cancer with lung meds. And she's got the same vitals and the same presentation and the same living will checked off. Um, what would you do in this situation? Would you intubate? Who would intubate? Who would not intubate? Right, nobody would intubate, right? She's got the living will. It says, I don't want mechanical ventilation. She has a very clear terminal disease. It's very obvious. Now what if Mrs. B had a pneumonia on top of her cancer? And it was the pneumonia that was causing her decompensation, which is reversible with antibiotics. Do you intubate then? It's a little wishy-washy. So you can see how these, these documents do not stand on their own. They give a false sense of security, in my opinion, to some of the people that possess them. And so you really have to know and have discussions with your surrogate decision makers as patient and also as a physician you have to talk to people about what these words mean and exactly what it is. 